we are live, we can start. Yeah, like we can go yeah. ahead with the um, conference now. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's me, Dr. Devi Shetty, speaking from my farmhouse in Bangalore. First of all, I would like to congratulate everyone who took the trouble of creating what I call as perhaps one of India's first IOTA alert program. This is a very, very important program for the nation, for the doctors, surgeons, cardiologists, everyone who have interest in the area of aortic surgery and aortic treatment. According to me, after having worked in this area for so many years, aorta is, in my opinion, a dispensable organ, a dispensable organ which really doesn't have any intelligent functions. And if the surgeons have the skill to replace it without hurting the other organs. We can transform the way aortic complication, aortic diseases are treated. So once again, I would like to congratulate and compliment the entire team for their great contribution. And I hope they continue uh, this education program every year. Thank you so much. Good luck and God bless. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Shetty. Uh, internationally, 19th of September is celebrated as uh, Aortic Dissection Awareness Day. We took this opportunity to introduce a teaching webinar in India to educate the physician population about this life-threatening disease. We may never truly understand the true prevalence of aortic dissection in the general population because it is much like the tip of an iceberg. Most of the patients die even before they reach the hospital. And from those who do reach the hospital, their presentations are often so vague and uh, confusing that the diagnosis of aortic dissection is often a diagnosis of exclusion and not the primary diagnosis. From our experience of over 20 years of operating these patients in India, we understand that compared to our Western counterparts, our Indian patients are much younger and have a lot more to lose. And because of the lack of diagnosis or the delay in diagnosis, they often come late to the tertiary referral centers, which is why we would like this, what we our hope for this program is to reinforce the, the concepts behind aortic dissection and give our physicians a better understanding of the treatment and management of this disease. I would now like to introduce our other colleague, Dr. Nimrat. She is a cardiac surgeon from the Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. And I, uh, together we have started this IOTA Alert program. Nimrat, on to you. Thank you, Dr. Warren. First of all, thank you, Dr. Devi Shetty for your kind introduction of our program. And thank you, Dr. Warren for introducing me. Good afternoon to everyone joining us. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to our first AORTA Alert event on the International Type A Dissection Awareness Day. Like Dr. Warren already said, making the diagnosis of a type A dissection is actually quite difficult, but the condition is not as rare as we think it is. An acute aortic dissection is a potentially life-threatening and time-critical condition that is frequently misdiagnosed. And therefore, its prompt and proper diagnosis is vital to increase a patient's chance of survival and to prevent grievous complications. 
We need to bundle our expertise to work together to achieve the best outcome for the patient. And our Aorta Alert project has a mission to raise awareness and educate about aortic dissection in the general population and healthcare professionals as well, with early diagnosis improving the chances of survival. Our Aorta Alert program is, like Dr. Warren said, a collaboration between the Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands and the Narayana Health Center in India. And it's an opportunity to make a difference by raising awareness in the whole country. To keep this live session more engaging and keeping everyone involved, I would encourage you to please send in your questions through the Q&A function of your screen during the presentations as well. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session. I hope you will all enjoy the presentations this afternoon. It's an immense pleasure to now request Dr. Devi Shetty to share his experience with all of us. Can you switch to Dr. Devi Shetty's presentation, please? Sure, ma'am. I'm sharing this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Worldwide Iotic Dissection Awareness Day on the 19th of September. I'm extremely grateful to the organizers for creating the awareness about aortic dissection and aortic disease. Before I start my talk, I would like to narrate a very sad story of my initial experience on aortic aneurysms when I started my career in Calcutta over 32 years ago. I can never ever forget the face of the patient. He was a young monk, hardly 32 year old, from a very, very famous religious sect of Eastern India. He was someone special because it was the first aortic aneurysm I saw in India when I was about to start my career. He had a very straightforward annulo aortic ectasia with a large aneurysm with gross aortic regurgitation required a straightforward bentol operation. I obviously advise him to undergo the operation and explain to them in detail. Obviously, he was scared, worried, apprehensive, had a lot of questions. Then he looked at my eyes and asked me, how many of such operations you have done in your career? I told him honestly that I haven't done any of those in India, but back in England, I did several of them especially the emergency bentol operations. He nodded and uh, left my consultation room and I was expecting him to come back after a few days for the surgery. But sadly, I heard a very bad news. The monks who brought him, his colleague monks, told me that this Swamiji committed suicide by walking into the ocean. And I was obviously sad but curious. I wanted to know why he ended his life. He could have undergone the operation. And it was a very sad story. After he saw me, he consulted several doctors and all of them told him that it's an extremely complex operation. He may not survive and even if he survives, he will not be able to function like a normal person because hardly any such operations are done in the country. And obviously the monk didn't want to be a burden on the society and he ended his life. It happened mainly because of lack of awareness by us, the doctors, about what is available to help these people with these complex problems. 
But fortunately, today's younger generation of doctors are a lot more knowledgeable, aware, and they give the right advice most of the time. Across the country, surgery for aortic dissection and aortic aneurysm has come a long way. I distinctly remember with my experience of being a heart surgeon in India for over 30 years. Large number of patients with bicuspid aortic valve with dilated ascending aorta only had an aortic valve replacement and few years later they presented with the giant aneurysm of the ascending aorta which needed a second operation. Today replacing the ascending aorta when it is dilated during the bicuspid aortic valve surgery has become a standard operation because it is a matter of time before they become aneurysm. One of the greatest challenge we face as heart surgeons in India is the Marfan syndrome with aortic dissection, especially when the aortic dissection extends from the ascending aorta to the aortic bifurcation. The problem is they need multiple surgeries, multiple major operations. I will try to share a photograph from the old brochure which I did maybe around 15-20 years ago. This is the photograph of the brochure of a young man who was about to join a professional college with Marfan syndrome and had multiple level involvement of the iota. Let me read the content of this brochure. When he was 16 year old in the year 2000, August 2000, he had a bentol procedure to replace the aortic valve and the ascending aorta. 2001, that's one year later, he had a replacement of descending thoracic aorta with the Dacron tube and reimplantation of the spinal arteries. In 2002, when he was 18 years, he had a replacement of abdominal aorta with reimplantation of renal celiac mesenteric arteries with the Dacron tube. Then he had a long break at the age of 24 years. In 2008 November, he had a replacement of the aortic arch because that was the only part which was left out with the reimplantation of carotid and subclavian arteries. And also he had gross mitral regurgitation for which he had a mitral valve replacement. And this man finished his engineering, got married, has lovely children, and he is leading a normal life and he has no iota. So all I want to tell you is that is iota dispensable? Yes, it is dispensable. It is a part of the body which has no intelligent function, at least not very much of an intelligent function. It is a tube. And this tube, if we can replace it with the Dacron tube, without losing blood and protecting the organ during the procedure, we can tackle any of the problems in iota. The greatest challenge in all the aortic aneurysm surgery is the bleeding. And I would like to congratulate our young team of surgeons who are doing a phenomenal job. Believe me, they are doing a much better job than what I did as a young surgeon. And today they are replacing the aortic arch as if it is one of those uh, straightforward ASD closure surgeries. And I am surprised at the number of aortic arch replacement they are doing virtually on a daily basis. I never knew that that many patients require major surgeries to replace aortic arch, thoracoabdominal aorta. 
which has become like a virtually a standard operation. So I'm very, very proud of the team which is doing the work. Having said that, greatest challenge for any hospital investing on aortic aneurysm surgery is the cost of the procedure. Once we uh, have health insurance penetrating middle class families, I'm sure aortic aneurysm surgery will become a standard procedure. I would like to end my talk with a very, very humble request. My request is to pass on one simple message to all your professional colleagues who are practicing in our country. I'm so happy that today thrombolytic therapy is offered virtually in every nursing home. And this has saved thousands and thousands of lives. But before they start thrombolytic therapy, on a patient with suspected myocardial infarction with ECG changes. I would like them to do two tests. One is a chest X-ray to look for the mediastinal widening. Other one is a echocardiogram and look for a dissection in every patient who is receiving thrombolytic therapy. Because the way a patient presents to the hospital with acute dissection of the iota and the way a patient presents with the acute coronary syndrome is exactly the same. There is no way you can differentiate unless you have done the echo and looked at the ascending iota where you see a floating flap. Why this is important? This is important because we get large number of acute aortic dissections now because of the increased awareness across the country on acute aortic dissection. But some places where they may not have the freely available echocardiogram or any other tools to diagnose acute dissection, patient receives thrombolytic therapy. And believe me, today's thrombolytic therapy medicines are deadly. Patient will not clot with this medication for the next at least one week. But if they have a dissection, if the patient received a thrombolytic therapy, thinking that it is a heart attack and Ultimately, when it gets diagnosed and the patient comes here, we spend liters and liters of blood after the operation. That is the only risk we face today in managing acute aortic dissection with surgical intervention. And the second message I would like to give it to you, which I would like you to pass it on to your colleagues. If somebody has aneurysm of the iota anywhere, ascending iota, arch, descending thoracoabdominal, doesn't matter. If they have aortic aneurysm, which requires surgery, which obviously is a very expensive operation in any hospital, including our hospital. And if the patient has financial difficulty, just don't bother. Send the patient with a letter that this patient cannot afford to pay the cost of surgery, please give concession. And if you strongly feel it has to be done entirely free, no problem. Please mention there and we will do it free of cost. God has put us in a privileged position to do those operations, even if the patient doesn't pay the money. This is our message to all of you. And I'm extremely grateful to spare your precious time on a weekend to spend with us. Good luck and God bless. And any time in the future, if you need any assistance from any one of us, we are at your service. Thank you so much. Good luck and God bless.
thank you dr shetty for that uh, wonderful talk entire entailing your experience with aortic aneurysm and dissection surgery our next speaker is dr siddhant mehra who is our chief resident and soon to be junior consultant we asked dr siddhant to give his to give a talk today because he has a very keen interest in aortic surgery and would like to pursue a career in that direction he is going to be talking about the pathophysiology and the risk factors for the development of aortic aneurysm and aortic dissection good afternoon my name is dr siddhant mehra and i will be talking about the pathophysiology in aortic aneurysms and dissections aortic aneurysms pose a unique challenge to our primary care physicians cardiologists and cardiac surgeons since they usually remain asymptomatic until they present with a dissection or a rupture an aneurysm is defined as the dilatation of a blood vessel to more than 1.5 times its expected diameter for body weight age and sex the incidence of thoracic aortic aneurysms is 5 to 10% per 100000 patient years with a peak incidence during the 6th and 7th decades of life men are affected twice as more frequently as women the actual number of aneurysm related deaths are probably underestimated because of the unknown fatal dissections and ruptures that don't make it to a hospital a overview of the histology the aorta is the largest vessel in the body it is an elastic artery and it has three layers the tunica intima the tunica media and the tunica adventitia the tunica adventitia is the outermost layer of the aortic wall it is made up of collagen fibers some elastic fibers fibroblasts and mast cells the connective tissue of the adventitia contains vasa vasorum the tunica media is the middle layer and it is the thickest out of the three it is composed of smooth muscle cells collagen fibers type 1 and 3 and many elastic fibers The elastic fibers are arranged in concentric layers called elastic lamellae. The external elastic lamina separates the tunica media and the tunica adventitia. The tunica intima is the innermost layer. It is thin and composed of a single layer of endothelial cells. Subendothelial cells contain loose connective tissue and a few fibroblasts. There are additional cells known as myointimal cells. These accumulate lipids and increase thickness of the layers as age increases. The internal elastic lamina separates the tunica intima and the tunica media. This is a picture showing the three layers of the aortic wall: the tunica adventitia, the tunica media, and the tunica intima. The normal ascending aorta functions as an elastic reservoir to enhance arterial flow. It stores energy during systole and dissipates it during diastole. The medial layer ensures elasticity and tensile strength of the aortic wall. The ascending aorta is more elastic than the descending part due to its greater concentration of elastic fibers. Pathology in aortic aneurysm. Histological examination demonstrates that the pathophysiological processes in aortic aneurysm involve all layers of the aortic wall in a variable proportion. Aneurysms results from an association of genetic predisposition, stress within the aortic wall. protolytic degradation of the structural components and or inflammation and autoimmune responses medial degeneration which involves disruption of elastic fibers and accumulation of proteoglycans seems to be the most common feature in patients with an aortic aneurysm pathophysiological process in an aneurysm differ from that of an occlusive atherosclerosis wherein the aneurysm involves all layers of the aortic wall coming to the light microscopy findings There is degradation of the extracellular elastin and collagen fibers, cystic medial changes and fibrosis, reduction in the number of vascular smooth muscle cells, medial and adventitial infiltration by mononuclear lymphocytes and macrophages. Medial splitting by hemorrhage due to elastic fragmentation and fibrosis has been observed in dissecting aneurysms. The aneurysms of the ascending aorta are usually fusiform, being associated with degenerative or inflammatory processes. Most common histopathological feature noticed is cystic medial degeneration. Medial changes are variably associated with wall thinning, elastic lamellae disruption, coagulative necrosis, or laminar medial necrosis is seen in elderly or hypertensive patients. 
So on your left, we have elastic fiber fragmentation. On the right, the most common feature, which is the cystic medial degeneration. So all these result in eventual wall expansion, resulting in aortic root dilatation, annuloaortic ectasia, or ascending aortic aneurysm. According to the risk factors, patients with inherited connective tissue diseases are younger and their lesions are more severe than those diagnosed with a bicuspid aortic valve or who have uncontrolled hypertension. Intramedial dissection leads to development of a false channel in the outer third of the media, where a hematoma forms with fresh plated fibrin thrombus, sometimes with detachment of the adventitial layer or the intimal tear. As you can see on the right, uh, due to a dissection, we have an intramural hematoma which has formed. Coming to the etiopathogenesis, uh, the most common cause for an aortic aneurysm seems to be a degenerative cause due to atherosclerosis, uncontrolled hypertension, smoking, or increased age. The exact mechanism is not fully understood, uh, but there seems to be an increased activity of the matrix metalloproteinase 9 and the matrix metalloproteinase 2. Connective tissue disorders such as Marfan syndrome and the Lois Dietz syndrome. Here, there is instability of the extracellular matrix due to fibrillin 1 mutation and uh, transforming growth factor beta receptor mutation. These patients usually present with annuloaortic ectasia. Annuloaortic ectasia can be isolated or can occur as a part of a generalized connective tissue disorder. The aorta in Marfan's exhibits the typical features of cystic medial degeneration with the disruption of the elastic fibers and fibrosis of the media. Up to 85% of patients with Marfan's have aortic root dilatation with or without associated aortic regurgitation. Congenital anomalies of the aortic valve, uh, such as bicuspid and unicuspid aortic valve. Here, uh, there is congenital aortopathy and altered hemodynamics in the ascending aorta, which are attributed to the altered valve morphology. And again, they have uh, medial degeneration in their aortic wall. Genetic causes, familial aortic aneurysms, uh, not related to any syndrome, due to mutations in the genes coding for contractile function of smooth muscle cells or the transforming growth factor beta receptor. Aortitis uh, is another cause to develop uh, aortic aneurysms and dissections. Post-inflammatory aortic dilatation after an inflammatory change in the aortic wall, which can be due to systemic arthritis, such as Takayasu arteritis, Kawasaki disease, giant cell arthritis, which involve the ascending aorta and initiate formation of an aneurysm. An aseptic inflammatory process in the medial layer of the aorta is presumed to induce medial destruction, which leads to weakening of the aortic wall and potential aneurysm formation and dissection. So who is at risk? Uh, smokers, because smoking greatly increases the risk of developing an aortic aneurysm, uncontrolled hypertension, elevated cholesterol levels, atherosclerosis, connective tissue disorders, familial aortic aneurysms, and aortitis, are risk factors for patients to develop aortic aneurysm and eventual dissection or rupture if not detected early. So we need to have a high index of suspicion to promptly diagnose aortic aneurysm and dissections, and this will help prevent fatal complications and ensure better results. Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much, Dr. Sedan, for your beautiful overview on the bad physiology of type A dissections. Our next presentation is about diagnosing a type A aortic dissection in emergency setting and will be presented by Dr. Satish Govind, consultant and head of department of cardiac echocardiography at the Narayana Health Bangalore. Looking forward to your talk, Dr. Satish. Can you please turn on this presentation? to all of you. Let's now move on to imaging and I will be focusing on the uh, diagnostic importance of uh, echo in type A aortic dissection. A brief overview of the anatomy. Uh, one is uh, to look at the aorta itself. It has got multiple parts which has been labeled as aortic root right at the beginning and then it goes up and forms this very crucial uh, part called as the ascending aorta, and then it curves upwards into the aortic arch and then descends all the way down 
It's a very long passage all the way down from the thorax into the uh, abdomen, and this is the descending aorta. So you have the thoracic part and the abdominal aorta. Next is, uh, let's uh, uh, look into the thoracic cavity itself. So this is the ascending aorta and the aortic arch with branches. Now let's do a deep dive right inside the ascending aorta itself. So now looking into the aortic valve and uh, coming up slightly uh, up the ascending aorta, uh, there are the three uh, openings of the aortic arch over there. So that is where the branches arise from. So the aortic arch itself has got the proximal arch and then the distal arch. And the aortic arch continues uh, forward and bends downwards into the descending thoracic aorta, which you see over there. A little uh, bit of a closer look at the branches of the aortic arch. Uh, there is the left subclavian, left common carotid, and the right uh, brachiocephalic. So these are the openings, and uh, they can be involved if the aortic uh, dissection involves these uh, aortic arch branches, or it may not be. On the other side, there is the aortic valve itself. It's a very uh, elegant and a very uh, delicate and nicely balanced uh, structure, and it has a very synchronous movement, allows the flow. Any disturbance in the uh, arrangement of these uh, cusps over there leads to aortic regurgitation, and aortic dissection type A is a big culprit and can cause uh, uh, AR of uh, any magnitude. And also equally important are these uh, two openings, the uh, uh, ostea of the coronary arteries. So uh, here you see the left coronary uh, ostea and then the right coronary ostea. So the right coronary one is the one which is most often involved. And they're very close to the aortic cusp. Uh, that is something which one has to remember when the aortic uh, root is involved. Now the types of aortic dissection, I'll not go too much into it. Just a brief look at uh, the one which is widely used. So here we have the type A dissection and the type B dissection. So type A is the one which involves the ascending aorta and the type B is the one which uh, starts after the aortic arch. My focus is primarily on type A and uh, this is where I would be looking to see in terms of echo. Uh, and these are the, the middle images are the ones which uh, shows uh, uh, images which I have sourced from literature and uh, they uh, show how the actual specimens of uh, aortic dissection look like. So it's a very angry looking aorta, a lot of uh, hematoma bleeding into the walls of the aorta. And once the aorta is opened up, you can see the dissection which has happened over there and there's a large thrombus inside. Now, how does it look on echo? So echo itself, uh, these are very obvious images, cross images, and uh, they can come in different types. So the ones which I'm showing are really uh, sort of very obvious ones. So what is commonly described in uh, literature textbooks is the dissection flap. So this is how a typical flap looks like. And you can see that the ascending aorta, which is labeled over there, is grossly dilated from here to here. And the LV is on this side. And color flow helps in looking at the flow within the uh, lumen and the false lumen also, and also the presence of aortic regurgitation. The other value of uh, uh, echo is to look at uh, any abnormalities within the lumen itself, the false lumen especially. So the presence of thrombus, which uh, the arrow is pointing towards. So th these are sort of very characteristic find. Now let us look at individual patients. So here is a 43 year old male, hypertensive, came with severe backache, uh, high uh, blood pressure, uh, non-specific ECG changes, uh, and was uh, seen and imaged uh, uh, in CCU using transthoracic echo. Uh, so here you can see that uh, this is a different type of dissection flap and uh, the arrow pointing here in the ascending aorta shows that the line which is there, that is where the dissection flap is and there's a small gap and that's the uh, false lumen over there. And it starts somewhere at the aortic root here and color provides additional information of flow going into it and also the presence of aortic regurgitation. In addition to looking at uh, the detection itself, one can also localize to a large extent. So here you can see that with the use of what is called as the biplane imaging, so simultaneous imaging is obtained and uh, the localization of the dissection can be made. So here uh, we can sort of safely conclude that it is postolateral in location. The aortic arch also can be investigated, absence of aortic arch involvement in this patient. Abdominal aorta has been investigated here, nothing uh, to be seen here. So it is uh, primarily a type A aortic dissection uh, confined to the ascending aorta. And after that, the LV function is looked at and also the presence of pericardial effusion, which is a bad omen. So there's no pericardial effusion in this particular patient and also looking at the severity of aortic regurgitation. So there's no regurgitation, not much here, good for the patient. 
uh, in uh, uh, odd patients, now and then when the windows are good, one can actually look at the coronary artery very closely and very nicely. So here is the left main, which is nicely seen. So the big arrow shows the course of the left main and the small arrow here shows the location of the aortic dissection. So it is quite away from it. So we can safely conclude that the left coronary is not involved and this is more towards the right coronary. And uh, these are images both longitudinally and cross-sectionally. One can look at the lumen, the patents of it, the flow inside it, and that is where uh, it can be very useful. So this particular patient had a type A dissection and it had started from the ST junction and uh, it was uh, extending along it, uh, the postrolateral aortic wall and partly involving the non-coronary sinus and it went all the way up to the innominate artery. Uh, he underwent a successful surgery, had an aortic graft, buttressing done at the non-coronary sinus and coronaries and aortic valve were not involved and uh, so they were spared and uh, that was a happy uh, ending for this patient. So the uh, uh, message from this is the utility of transthoracic echo. It can diagnose and localize dissection. Iota can be sized very accurately. Thrombus presence can be seen. LV function can be assessed. Presence of wall motion abnormalities is another huge plus by echo. And uh, morphology of aortic valve, whether it is bileaflet, trileaflet. Severity of AR, if it is there, how bad is it? And uh, decision on the aortic valve sparing can be done. It can also detect coronary artery involvement and also the presence or absence of tamponade. Another patient, uh, this is a lady, eight months pregnant, a young lady, uh, backache, hypertension, and was diagnosed to have aortic dissection elsewhere from out of state and was rushed here. She had a viable pregnancy. And when she came, she was uh, mildly sort of, I would say, you know, hemodynamically unstable. So she was immediately uh, imaged in triage and where here a T was done, uh, uh, looking at the uh, precariousness of the situation. And uh, so this is a patient where a T was done. So as you can see here, the T images are much, much better. The resolution is really great and improved. And the ascending aorta is seen. And the classic uh, flap, the dissection flap is also seen. And there's a small gap here. This is the arrow which is pointing towards a small gap. So this is where the tear has happened. And from here onwards, the false lumen has started. And the flow uh, confirms this, the color flow. And one can also localize even by T. So an angulation of the uh, probe up and down uh, can uh, tell us. So here in the first image, uh, you barely see the uh, dissection here. So it uh, tells us that the dissection is not at this point. But as the probe is uh, moved a little uh, upwards, you can start to see the dissection flap. And one can safely say at, that this is at the level of the aortic leaflets. And this is where the dissection is starting, most probably at the ST junction. And as the probe is withdrawn, you can see that the dissection uh, starts to increase in uh, size. So telling that it is getting more and more extensive as it courses upwards. The coronary arteries also can be well seen. So this is the left coronary artery. So this is well away from the dissection and the right coronary artery very close. And uh, uh, sort of we can reasonably conclude that the right coronary artery is away and is possibly spared from the uh, 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 from the dis dissection where it is originated. And uh, further uh, investigation by the probe itself, one can go up along the ascending aorta. So this is the ascending aorta somewhere higher up. And at some point, there's a blind spot where the T probe does not really look into it. This is where the weakness of the T is. So there is a spot where uh, it is not possible to visualize the ascending aorta. This, uh, the, uh, this is an image of the uh, aortic arch. And uh, again, the flap is there. So we can uh, definitely conclude that the uh, uh, aortic dissection is extended up to the uh, aortic arch. And uh, it is also going beyond, and this is the descending aorta. So it is extending into the descending aorta also here. So there's small sort of seg uh, sediments here, so suggesting that there's a possible thrombus at this uh, point. Then uh, this again emphasizes the value of T in type A dissection. One in addition, uh, additionally, we can look at the wall motion abnormality, LV function, presence of aortic regurgitation also. It is a useful alternative in patients who cannot undergo CT and MRI. Uh, this particular patient, again, had a good ending, successful end event, emergency surgery. So the utility of T, superior images, iota can be very nicely seen. The aortic root, especially the ascending aorta, descending also, and can be sized very accurately. Flap can be identified. The tear, the entry point can be identified. Thrombus presence can be identified. AR can be uh, quantified uh, very nicely. Aortic valve assessment, uh, again, uh, like transthoracic echo, can be identified very nicely. LV function assessment, uh, very useful. And coronary arteries also, not in all patients, but to a large extent, it can be done. And also, uh, one can look at plaques 
And uh, to some extent, tetramural hematoma, not so great by T, but definitely it can be identified even by transthoracic echo also. And then the penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer, so also can be uh, identified to some extent and definitely the aneurysms. Now, uh, let's look at another patient. So this is a young boy uh, student and uh, he was having chest discomfort and breathlessness progressively. And uh, uh, since the last uh, two, three, uh, three days before he landed up at the hospital, and uh, what brought him to the hospital was a sudden syncope. And uh, uh, he was found to have a high BP, a stable uh, patient, uh, but he was quite symptomatic, unable to lie down. Uh, and on uh, uh, repeated questioning later on, he disclosed that uh, he was diagnosed to have hypertension some months back, but never bothered about it, did not tell anybody, even including his parents or friends, never took any medications. And he was imaged in uh, the uh, CCU, transthoracic echo was done in this patient. So again, the aortic dilatation uh, it can be seen very nicely. And then there's a small sort of a fluttering here. So suggesting the possible aortic dissection at this point, not very clear, but uh, uh, one can uh, definitely say with a uh, high suspicion that there is possible dis uh, dissection out there. And uh, what sort of strengthens the, uh, the diagnosis is the presence of aortic regurgitation. Here you can see that the blue color, this is a flow which tells that there is significant AI. And also there is a very severely sort of hypertrophied LV. So suggesting that uh, this patient had blood pressure for quite some time and also LV di was dilated. Uh, but what was interesting and of concern and alarming is that uh, presence of pericardial effusion. Presence of pericardial effusion indicates that there is impending rupture. And uh, this is something which one has to uh, sort of take into consideration and uh, things have to be managed very quickly here afterwards. So you can see that there is also depression of the chamber here. So it's suggesting that uh, there is some amount of uh, diastolic collapse. So that means that there is tamponade. So this patient had tamponade in addition to the type A dissection. And uh, this is a closer look of the uh, aortic uh, short uh, axis, what we call, and again, the collapse of the uh, RV here. So obliterating the RVOT here, suggesting that there is tamponade and the presence of aortic regurgitation can be made out here. That is a blue color. And in this image, uh, one can see that the LV dysfunction is reduced and there is also presence of pericardial effusion confirmation from a different view. And uh, presence of aortic regurgitation also viewed in a different angle. And uh, the aortic arch was not involved. So the diagnosis at this stage was young adults, severe hypertension, aortic root and ascending aortic aneurysm, likely aortic dissection, uh, type A. And uh, the important thing was that he had tamponade and significant AR, LV dysfunction. So not a good uh, sort of set of findings for uh, an outcome. So this patient was extensively worked up and uh, was at far, far, fast track and then was prepared for surgery once the workup was done. And just as it was about to be wheeled in, uh, again, another echo was done uh, just uh, uh, because the anesthesiologist wanted to take a, uh, uh, wanted to have another uh, imaging set. And here uh, shows that uh, why it is important to sort of constantly and uh, sort of very carefully monitor these patients who sort of deteriorate very badly and they have a very downhill course. So in just a matter of few hours, as the patient was being prepared for surgery, so now uh, you can see that it's been done on a different machine. Uh, the the, the, the dis dissection, which was not really visible in the earlier image, now appears to be a little more prominent. So it has started to increase. And the presence of 3D here shows the dissection flap very clearly. So again, 3D can be a very useful tool to confirm dissection. And... Uh, uh, another important finding popped up in this uh, particular patient. So this is a condition called as intramural hematoma. And you can see that in this uh, 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 image here, the wall of the aorta has normal thickness. But uh, uh, in this second image, which was done later, the wall of the aorta has thickened now. So this is a very classic finding, intramural hematoma, not generally seen, but when it is seen, it is again a cause for alarm. That means that the dissection is uh, worsening and uh, uh, things have to be, you know, the preparation for intervention has to be uh, fast-tracked and to be done at as fast as possible, especially with tamponade. So this is a patient with potential catastrophe if uh, things are not uh, uh, put in place in terms of intervention. Uh, he was taken into the OT, and these are the happy majors from the uh, OT. So the valve has been replaced, nicely functioning uh, aortic valve here. He had a conduit also placed in, so everything sort of went very nicely uh, on table inside the OT. And uh, he had a good post-op uneventful recovery. And these are the pre-discharge uh, images showing uh, the LV much more happier here, contracting very nicely. 
and the mechanical valve is functioning quite well. And then there's no regurgitation and uh, there's no pericardial effusion. So a very good, uh, happy ending, despite all the uh, odds uh, and uh, complications this patient had, uh, demonstrating the importance of uh, uh, the early intervention. So uh, just to emphasize, so this patient uh, tells us about the importance of monitoring and early intervention. So he had uh, aortic dilatation, aneurysm, type A dissection, cardiac tamponade, significant AR, LV dysfunction, and intramural hematoma. He had successful outcome despite multiple complications. So to conclude, uh, emphasizing the role of transthoracic echo and transesophageal echo. So it is emphasized in all guidelines and uh, uh, very clearly mentioned that it is a first imaging modality, especially when they are symptomatic. So uh, always any patient suspected dissection, echo has to be done immediately, the transthoracic echo. T is uh, a secondary test and uh, it's got very high diagnostic accuracy and it has its own uh, issues and limitations in terms of availability and the skill. So it is used as a second as a, a sort of a standby imaging modality, but has got great utility when used. Uh, again, from the guidelines, so this is from the European Society, and uh, again, any of the major societies, they all recommend. So transthoracic echo is an initial imaging investigation. So this is very clearly emphasized, and it is a class one recommendation. And in unstable patients where there's suspicion of acute aortic syndrome, uh, these are the recommendations. The T has to come first, and then CT comes second. So this is, again, a class one recommendation. But in patients who, have, who are stable, uh, with suspicion of acute aortic syndrome. CT takes priority here, MRI takes priority, they are class one, and the T is like a standby in case if things don't work out. Now, what about the advantages, the pros and cons vis-a-vis -vis the other imaging modalities? So I will just focus on the uh, pluses of the transthoracic echo and the T's. So it uh, has a lot of value, you can see by the three pluses here in terms of looking at aortic regurgitation, looking at LV function, wall motion abnormality, pericardial tamponade, and T also has got uh, very high sensitivity in terms of establishing uh, the type 8 dissection in uh, aortic dissection. And uh, to some extent, it can be uh, useful in terms of the intramural hematomas and other findings of uh, uh, aortic dissection in T. And the TT has got limitations where uh, it's uh, certain areas it cannot do. So this is the uh, advantage of ECHO. So in the uh, algorithm, again, very clearly uh, treatment algorithm, you can see that uh, TT is the first line. Uh, the transthoracic echo again mentioned here, and later on T comes into place uh, as the patient is uh, worked up more extensively. I would like to end with uh, two anecdotal stories. So one is uh, uh, personality King George II of England. So this uh, is a story which happened in 1760. Uh, he got up in the morning and then later on was found to be unresponsive and found dead eventually. And uh, the king's doctor did a postmortem and uh, did the first ever description. So this is uh, uh, sort of uh, repeatedly emphasized in the history of aortic dissections. The first ever explicitly described uh, uh, description of how, what really happened in the post-mortem of the uh, of a person who dies of aortic dissection. He mentioned that the aorta was torn, the, there was a lot of fluid around the heart, and there was a big thrombus. So this was a tragic story where uh, there was sudden death and uh, uh, how uh, aortic dissection can kill if it is untreated. The other side extreme of the story is this uh, person, iconic uh, uh, person, Dr. DeBakey himself. Uh, he's got his own classification, a pioneer in aortic dissection. So in his uh, 80s, he himself underwent dissection as he was coming in the elevator at his hospital. And he was immediately sort of managed. And then over a period of time, uh, he underwent surgery and he eventually recovered from it. And he went on to live for many more years. So this is the other extreme where early intervention, early detection can help uh, in uh, treatment of aortic uh, dissection, especially the type A. So uh, I would like to uh, conclude with uh, a message as far as echo is concerned. So when symptoms occur, it is a first line uh, imaging modality, especially the transthoracic echo. So the key to survival is early detection and the transthoracic echo is very important. The sensitivity earlier with uh, older machines was 78. Now it has really improved and especially with T, it is almost 100%. And this is especially true when it comes to proximal aorta involvement. It is widely available and uh, the results are uh, available, uh, avail, uh, can, can, can be immediately availed of. The uh, TT is also life saving. So it's very important to emphasize that uh, the, uh, any delay of uh, every hour uh, increase the risk of mortality by one to 2%. So this is something which has to be kept in mind. So there has to be immediate attention to the uh, diagnosis. 
T is an alternative. So this is a, a, a title of a case report which I picked up, which sort of uh, has a very classic line. So here is type aortic dissection, role of echo, every second counts. I think that is a message uh, from echo uh, in terms of type A dissection. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Satish, for that very informative uh, lecture on uh, echocardiography in type A aortic dissection. Uh, I would like to re-emphasize once again that the echocardiography can be done very easily. It is a bedside test and it is very informative because as Dr. Satish said, every second counts. And when the physician has a doubt, it is uh, he can easily rule it out with a bedside DE. Even the uh, ancillary findings like a pericardial effusion uh, or a severe aortic regurgitation and a dilated ascending aorta should give the physician a suspicion that uh, this could be an acute aortic pathology. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Vimal Raj. Dr. Vimal Raj will be focusing on the uh, CT in type A aortic dissection. He is our consultant radiologist at uh, Narayana Health Bangalore. He's a prolific teacher and he has several teaching webinar sessions at his website, medempower.in. Uh, on to you, Dr. Vimal. for being here and uh, listening to me talk to you about aortic dissection. Aortic dissection is a very important acute disease which often requires multidisciplinary approach in appropriate management of patients. Imaging plays a very very important role in management of these patients and that is what I'm going to be focusing on today. My objectives for today are to demonstrate the role of imaging in assessment of patients with aortic dissection. While I'm doing this, I am going to show you multiple examples to highlight the importance of different protocols in imaging and what should one look for when they are facing a case of aortic dissection. Also, I will be highlighting the importance of having a good CT scanner or a high-end CT scanner because that will improve your diagnostic yield and will also reduce a lot of contrast that you use for patient. Iotic pathologies can be broadly classified into these four groups. To start with, we have acute aortic syndromes. These are syndromes which present acutely in patients and include aortic dissection. The second big group is aneurysm. So aortic aneurysms, be it thoracic or abdominal, can be a chronic pathology or can present as an acute setting also. The third group becomes traumatic aortic injuries. These can present as simple dissections or even transaction of aorta. And the fourth group often tends to be more of a chronic presentation or subacute presentation is aortitis, where there is inflammation of the wall of the aorta and that leads to multiple complications. In today's talk, we're gonna focus on acute aortic syndromes in specific reference to aortic dissection. Penetrating ulcer tends to be the precursor for acute aortic syndrome in most of the cases. There is usually a defect in the intimal layer of the aorta, which leads to leakage of blood from the lumen into the wall of aorta. This penetrating ulcers then leads to what is called as an intramural hematoma, which is nothing but blood within the wall of the aorta. If this pressure and the amount of blood keeps increasing, it creates a separate path within the wall of aorta, leading to aortic dissections. It is also possible that the penetrating ulcer directly leads into a aortic dissection path without forming an intramural hematoma. Penetrating ulcer need to be differentiated from a atherosclerotic ulcer 
Atherosclerotic ulcer is basically part of the atherosclerotic disease where there is some thrombus within the lumen which is irregular but the intimal layer is always intact. That is not the case with a penetrating ulcer. In a penetrating ulcer, as can be seen here, the intimal layer is breached and there is leak of contrast of blood into the wall of aorta. If left alone, this will invariably lead to a intramural hematoma, aortic dissection, or sometimes it leads to just growth of the same ulcer along the wall without any extension significantly into the superior or inferior aspect, otherwise called as a contained aortic dissection. Here is another case of a aortic uh, ulcer where you can see this is a penetrating ulcer, focal ulcer, which is leading to a bulge in the posterior wall of the aorta. This was treated by a endoluminal stent and you can see clearly very straightforward procedure and the ulcer is now taken care of so limiting any risk of developing a future dissection. Let's look at this particular image. This is the image of a young chap who had uh, come into the casualty with chest pain radiating to the back and we've done a CT scan and you look at the aorta here and the suspicion was a aortic dissection. You look at this aorta and you feel hey this iota looks normal. However, it is very important that we do a pre-contrast or a non-contrast CT scan. So in this patient, what you're looking at is this outer area of the iota is hyperdense compared to the inner area of iota. This is nothing but an intramural hematoma. An intramural hematoma is a precursor for aortic dissection and can be the only presentation that you will see. If we do this imaging after contrast, it is highly likely that we will miss this intramural hematoma. So always remember to do a non-contrast study in any acute aortic syndromes to ensure that you're not gonna be missing a intramural hematoma. This is another case where we've done a non-contrast CT and you look at the images across here, there is a small left pleural effusion, but nothing much that can be confidently said. But if we just change the windowing of the image, make it look a little bit more crispier, this area which looked normal here, you can start seeing is very abnormal across here and also across here. This is aortic dissection. So even without giving contrast, in some of the patients, we can detect uh, acute aortic dissections. And you can see two different lumen in this patient. You will come across cases where you cannot give contrast, be it because of contrast allergy or be it because of renal dysfunction where you do not want to give any contrast. A plain CT scan will be helpful as we've just seen to detect intramural hematomas or even dissections in some particular cases. Also look out for pericardial hemorrhage or hemopericardium, which can be seen as this bright structure encasing the heart. It is one of the very strong predictors of underlying acute aortic syndromes. On the other hand, we can also do an MRI scan, which does not need any contrast for us to be able to detect this intramural hematoma and also detect the true and the false lumen in aortic dissection. So what does a dissection look like and what should we be looking into a dissection? You can see here this is the aorta and you can see these flap like structures within the aorta. These are nothing but the dissection flaps. This is a layer of intima which has been pulled away from the wall and contrast has leaked into either side of the layer of intima. Whenever you see a dissection, these are the four pointers that everybody has to understand. First and foremost is the type of dissection with regards to Stanford classification. Second, we look at where does it start, where does it end. Third, we look for how is the uh, lumen aligned, which is the true lumen, which is the false lumen, and if there is any communication between each of these lumens. 
Fourth thing we look for is perfusion of the viscera relating to this dissection. Majority of aortic dissection cases are diagnostically easy on a CT scan. But sometimes you will face with specific cases like this where you have to start thinking whether this is a real aortic dissection or are we dealing with an artifact. For example, you can see here, this is the aortic root extending into ascending aorta. You can see these lines across here, one across here and the other one here. Are these actual dissection flaps or are they artifacts? Similarly, this is a different patient where you can see in the ascending aorta, there is this very nice clear flap dividing the aorta into two lumens. There's nothing in the descending aorta. And when we saw the images below this level and above this level, we did not see any dissection flaps. So was this just a localized dissection flap or was this an artifact? solution for this is to do an ECG gated study. ECG gated study restricts the movement of the heart and you can see the iota very clearly. So you can see this is the same patient here, ECG gating, that flap is no longer visible, suggestive of a actual artifact. So remember to do ECG gating whenever available. And for this particular reason, you actually need a high-end scanner. A minimum 64 slice scanner is required. We prefer to do ECG gating to ensure we look at the origin of the coronary arteries to ascertain whether they are involved with dissection or not. Once you have decided that there is dissection, we have to decide what type of dissection is it. Is it type A dissection whereby the flap starts proximal to the origin of the left subclavian artery. So the flap is in the ascending aorta, aortic root, or even the arch of aorta. Type B stands for dissection, is a dissection which starts distal to the origin of the left subclavian artery. Type A dissections usually involve surgeons and need to be considered for surgery, so there is no extension of dissection into the neck reducing the perfusion and leading to strokes. Type B dissections are often initially managed medically and are not a surgical candidate in most of the cases. Once you have decided the type of dissection, the next question is to recognize the true lumen from the false lumen. The two lumens are often equally perfused while one may be perfused more or less. There are different uh, determining factors which help us in deciding which is the true lumen and which is the false lumen. Some of the constant ones are the true lumen tends to be smaller while the false lumen tends to be bigger. The intimal calcification tends to be on the side of the true lumen rather than on the side of the false lumen. The false lumen outer wall tends to be uh, bare of any calcification. Opacification alone of each of the lumen should not be used for determining true versus false lumen. But if you're seeing some thrombus in a lumen, as is this case, it often tends to be a false lumen, while true lumen tends not to have any thrombus formation within it. You can see here nicely that this is a smaller lumen, this is the true lumen, and this is the outer one, which is the false lumen. Once we see the true lumen and the false lumen, please look out for areas of communication between the two, apart from the entry point and the exit point. These points of communications are called fenestrations, and these help in maintaining perfusion of different viscera and the lower limbs. Always look out for the vessels which are coming out of the iota and see whether they are involved with dissection or not. In this case, you can see that there is a dissection this is the right renal artery and this is the left renal artery. The right renal artery comes from the true lumen, seems to be having good flow and the perfusion of the right kidney is very good. The left renal artery is coming from the false lumen. Initially there is good perfusion. There is also some extension of dissection across here. Then there is no contrast flow in the left renal artery with 
no contrast flow in the left kidney. Another case where you can see a aortic dissection, where the dissection flap is extending into the superior mesenteric artery. And when you look at the scanogram of this patient, you can see that small bowel are all grossly dilated, all suggestive of underlying bowel ischemia and perhaps impending infarction. So please look out for these complications in your patients. Another common complication that we come across is aneurysmal dilatation of the iota. This tends not to be an acute uh, complication but tends to happen over a period of time where the false lumen tends to keep expanding because it does not have the normal layers of iota. Another complication that we need to be aware of is pulmonary complication which is often seen as pleural effusions and sometimes you can even have blood within the pleural cavity. It is important to look out for these uh, complications in every patient. You can see here ascending iota aneurysmally dilated, true lumen, false lumen, the false lumen is partially thrombosed. So to summarize, aortic dissection is a significant pathology and it needs a multidisciplinary approach involving the surgeons, the cardiologists, the intensivist and the radiologist. Imaging plays a significant role in determining future management of these patients. On imaging, uh, it is very important that you do a non-contrast CT first. Two, you ensure that you do an ECG-gated study. Third, when we start looking at aortic dissections, we have to look for the origin of the dissection and the exit of the dissection flap. We need to classify it as Stanford type A or type B dissection. Recognize the true lumen and the false lumen. Look for fenestrations and look for perfusion of different viscera because this will help in deciding what is the next plan of management of these patients. Having a high-end scanner always helps because you will get this information with least amount of contrast, with least amount of breath hold time, and you can also analyze the coronary arteries to ensure there is no coronary artery disease in these patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vimaraj. It was a wonderful presentation, very educational. Um, it's now time to take a short break. Um, we are a little ahead of schedule, therefore we propose to start the next session after 15 minutes. Um, let me do a quick calculation for the Indian Standard Time. That should be around 2.25 p.m. Please correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct, Nimrat. Okay, perfect. Then we'll see each other in 15 minutes.
Dr. Nimrat, we are live now. Yes, thank you. Welcome, Welcome back. back everyone after the short break. Our first talk after the break will be from Dr. Srinath Kumar, consultant and head of department of emergency department. Um, he'll talk about initial management in evaluation in type A dissections. Over to the presentation, please. Hi, I'm Dr. T.S. Srinath Kumar, Senior Consultant, Head and Group Coordinator for Narana Hrudyalaya. Today, over the next 15 minutes, I'll be talking about initial management of aortic dissection. One of the uncommon, or to say, the presentations which doesn't give a classical picture in the emergency department is aortic dissection. That is why it is very important on this particular day, we speak about the initial management of aortic dissection. So over the next 15 minutes, what are we going to see? We are going to see the case presentation. I'll go through one case, and then we'll see how to differential diagnosis in the emergency department, take an overview of the disease prospectus, look into the factors which cause the predisposing, and then the clinical features, what you have to do in the emergency department, as both as a workup as well as the management. So this is what you're going to see in the next 15 minutes. The patient was rushed to emergency, who is a 41-year-old male. On appearance, he was diaphoretic and anxious. He was complaining of a severe chest pain, which was radiating to the back. His airway was patent. His breathing was 28 per minute, and the saturation was 93%. So with this particular picture of blood pressure, of 150 by 80, only the heart rate, if you see, it's in the tachycardia side. And his disability and the exposure is quite normal. So now, what do we think? So we all usually think of, first is acute coronary syndrome, then myocarditis, or pulmonary embolism. Then comes your aortic dissection, or even an acute pancreatitis, cholecystitis, Bohab syndrome, or mechanical back pain. With this particular history, when you're going into the detailed history and a focused examination, you when you go into this, you always see that this patient is presenting with a tearing type of a pain over between the shoulder blades. And the onset of the pain is only 30 minutes. When you took a 12 ECG, it was significantly, there was no changes in the ST segment. So your acute coronary syndrome is partially left out. And when now, the, when the blood pressure, when you compare onto the right arm and the left arm, there is a variation. And then the bedside X-ray shows like this. So you can see, you whenever you see an X-ray, please go through the X-ray and look into each and every part which you're going to ask for it. And here you can see that the, X, the heart shadows and the aortic knuckle, Aortic knuckle is little bit enlarged. And then you further do a focus. That is the point of care ultrasound in the emergency department, which has taken a huge stride in the diagnosis of any kind of illness in the emergency services. So when you did a uh, echocardiogram bedside, you could see something here, which is showing the diagnosis you are inching towards what is the presentation of the patient. So you came to your diagnosis now of aortic dissection. So you see ECG was normal. In the earlier days, the echocardiogram was not available, but with the ultrasound machine being in the emergency department, doing a bedside echo, showing you the features of the aorta, which is enlarged, you can say that the patient can have an aortic dissection. So now, an overview of the aortic dissection. It is a catastrophe. Many a times it is a diagnosis made on suspicion because you straight away, whenever such patients come, you think more in case of pulmonary embolism or acute coronary syndrome. So, but if you don't diagnose aortic dissection, there is two to three times more common of rupture than the abdominal aorta. And when you leave untreated, most of the patients will die within 24 hours, that is 33%. That is a huge number. 
And if you don't treat them for 50, 48 hours, then 50%. And the mortality rate of the patients whom you treat early is very, very low, less than one to 2% per hour. So that is the reason why it is very important. And coming into the type A dissection, 60% of the aortic dissections are present with type A dissections and start before the subclavian artery origin. And if it affects usually the ascending aorta and the arch of the aorta. And may land up with the aortic incompetence. So then what we have to do, we have to look for the predisposing factors. Prior history, if any history of chest pain or he has left out and then hypotension and then look into any connective tissue disorders or any anatomical abnormalities which can cause an abnormal flow or you can also look if it is a female, take a history of pregnancy or polycystic ovarian diseases or any other family history. So this is what you're going to look in for any uh, predisposing factors. And typically, when you look into the clinical pictures, you always, the patients usually present with the chest pain radiating to the back. And 49% of these patients have a classical tearing, only 49%. And 51%, they don't present with any kind of an illness. So this is the reason why it is important. And whenever you look into these things, that is a patient presenting the symptoms above or below the diaphragm, chest pain with back pain, vomiting, or any kind of a neurological fictions, then it may be because of the dissection which is extending into the carotid arteries or sometimes the cardiac tamponade also. So, so if you see that any other patients, the hypertension is very, very common, but it is only 49%. So you see that the normal tension patients is 33% and patients can even come with an hypotension, which is 18%, which is again significant in number. So what do you do in an emergency department? You have to work up on these patients. What do you do for a workup? You have to take an x-ray or the bedside tool is a focus that is point of care, ultrasound machine, or, and also, and you can do a chest, this one CT scan, of the thorax, which is a gold standard in the diagnosis of the patient of the aortic aneurysm. Along with it, to rule out the acute coronary syndrome also, when you have taken the ECG, you can send also for the troponin, I, D-dimer, blood grouping and cross-matching because these patients can be going for the emergency operation theater also and look for the serum chemistry studies also. And as I mentioned, the CT scan with contrast is the gold standard. And you can see where the where you have to point pinpoint and see the aortic dissection. And it is very easy to take it off. So you see here it is clearer, and also you can see here. So this is how you're going to work up in the emergency department when the patient comes with a chest pain and a shearing attack. And then when your ECG is normal, please think two things. One is aortic dissection or pulmonary embolism. So with the guide, guide of echo, you can come down to your diagnosis level also. Then in the management of the emergency department, take care of your airway. That is very, very important. Supplement them with the oxygen. Hypoxia is very dangerous for them. So don't allow them to go for hypoxia. Give them oxygen supplementation and ventilation. Two large bore IV lines. That is at least preferably 18 gauge can when flood in both the hands so that you can give the medications or if the patient is having a hypotension, you can give one side, you can start the IV fluids, the other side you can start the inotropic agents. And also try to secure a arterial line so that you can give, see the real time blood pressure monitoring which will guide you to titrate the medications, which is important in this particular case. What are the medications of choice? This is the medications that we usually use, that is esmolol or levetolol, metoprolol, morphin, and sodium nitroprusside. So these are the various drugs which you use commonly as a medication of choice for these patients. So what is your target blood pressure? Our target blood pressure should be between 100 to 110 millimeters of mercury. So which is the best drug to titrate? That is esmolol. And we all know 
that is an it is an ultra short acting beta blocker and it is very useful in such patients especially to titrate the level arterial pressure anyhow you have already got the arterial line so you can check for the blood pressure and simultaneously you can try titrate the medication and it is usually used in conjunction with sodium nitroglycide which is another important drug which you can uh, titrate the drug, titrate in such patients and it is the best means of beta, beta blocker safety and the tolerance is also very good even in case of copd patients because we all know that copd or bronchial asthma it is a uh, uh, it this drug should not be used then what is your target heart rate the target heart rate should be between 60 to 80 blood pressure uh, beats per minute so usage of beta blockers will use will be very useful to reduce your blood pressure as well as, well as to uh, come to your target heart rate so the other drugs which are commonly used are levetilol metoprolol and sodium nitroprusside and we all know sodium nitroprusside is useful for the peripheral vasodilatation by its direct action on the venous and the arterial or smooth muscle, which reduces the peripheral resistance, thereby the preload is also been taken off and the load on the cardiac is reduced. So this is the region why you have to use. So this is the dosage which you have to use, the levetilol. You can start as a bolus and then you can continuously use as an IV infusion. And that is the earliest action that is five to 10 minutes. And as mentioned, Esmolol, the action starts within one to two minutes and the duration is 10 to 30 minutes. So you can titrate or even if you're taking the patient to the OT, you can immediately stop and the drug action will come down within 30 minutes. The vasodilator therapies which you which you are going to use is sodium nitroprusside or hydralazine or nitroglycerides. So these are the three other drugs which you can use. Among these three, Nitroprusside is a drug of choice in aortic dissection. Now, other important thing in the emergency department, these patients come with huge pain. We forget about it. Analgesia plays a main role both in alleviating his fear and also reducing the pain of the patient. So which is the best drug? The best drug is opioids and especially morphin. Morphin is both good as a narcotic analgesia and also, it is good for reducing the uh, this one, the peripheral vascular resistance and also for the preload of the cardiac output. So this is how it is very helpful for the morphine sulfate to be there. And it is also reliable and it is also safe. Now, with these things kept in mind, we you should never forget that one is workup is important, get the chest x-ray, Get your echocardiogram, get the CT scan, and get your CTVS surgeons to come into picture at the earliest. Get the get your workup right. Misdiagnosis is always you're going to lead to the fatal part of the patient. So you're going to lose the patient, which is not required for us. You have to gain. You have to make the diagnosis early in the emergency department. That is what is very, very important as an emergency physician in the emergency department, taking the right patient to the right place and giving them the right uh, focus and so that you're going to reduce the mortality of the patient. So in the medications, please don't forget Esmolol, Levetalol, Sodium Nitroprusside and in Analgesia Marfil. So this is how you have to keep in your mind. So with this, I'm very thankful to our organizing chairman and organizing secretary, Dr. Varun Shetty, who has given me an opportunity to speak in front of you all regarding the initial management of the aortic dissection. So our motto is each one to, should teach one to save more lives. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srinath Kumar, for your presentation and emphasizing how important the clinical presentation and initial management of these patients is. Our next speaker this afternoon is Dr. Varun Shetty. Dr. Varun Shetty is a cardiac surgeon at the Narayana Health Bangalore, specialized in aortic surgery. Working on several scientific projects and co-founding the Aorta Alert program with him has been a wonderful experience indeed. Our collaboration between Europe and India is really exciting. 
Dr. Warren, please tell us something about surgery in type A dissections. Hello and welcome to our first webinar CME on type A aortic dissection. I'm Dr. Varun Shetty, consultant cardiac surgeon at Narayana Institute of Cardiac Sciences. And today I'll be talking about surgery for type A aortic dissection, more on its surgical management and the results following surgery. Most pathologies affecting the aorta are often life-threatening. The incidence of type A dissection is nearly 30 cases per million per year. This is small in comparison to myocardial infarctions, but type A dissections are much more fatal. The mortality following a dissection is 1% per hour for the first 24 hours. Half are dead by the third day and nearly 80% are dead by the end of the second week. The first historical account describing type A dissection was by the physician of King George. In 1760, King George II collapsed in his bathroom. His physician at the time, Mr. Frank Nichols, was ordered to conduct his autopsy. The autopsy showed that the King George had died from a cardiac tamponade, secondary to an aortic dissection. He described this as a tear in the vessel wall causing an ecchymosis of the aorta. The terminology of aortic dissection was used 100 years later by Linac, but it took 200 years after the first description of aortic dissection for the surgery to be performed. On July 7, 1954, Michael DeBacchi and his team at the Houston Medical Center performed the first surgical replacement of a dissecting aneurysm with a Dacron graft. Subsequently, he and his team performed 250 such cases. The technique of surgery continues to remain the same even to this day. Why is type A dissection so dangerous? Acute type A accounts for nearly 50% of the aortic dissections, and the fatality is nearly 73% with the in-hospital death of nearly 50%. Surgery is indicated in type A because of the risk of tamponade, shock, congestive heart failure, secondary to aortic insufficiency, stroke, myocardial ischemia or infarction, and malperfusion in other critical organs. Before going into surgery, there are a few important questions that must be answered. One is the confirmation of the diagnosis. This is done mostly with CT scan. Then comes the location of the entry tear. Type A dissections involve the proximal aorta and in nearly all of them, surgery is indicated. Type B aortic dissections involve the aorta distal to the left subclavian artery. And in most of them, medical therapy is enough. From the CT scan, we can also get an understanding of which of the organs are perfused from the true lumen and which are being perfused from the newly created false lumen. We must also know if there is any involvement of the aortic valve, coronary arteries, and arch vessels, as this will govern the type of surgery. If the patient has a pre-existing aneurysm of the thoracic aorta, it must be addressed during this surgery itself. When it comes to organ malperfusion, mortality is much higher. In patients undergoing surgery with mesenteric malperfusion, the mortality is 63%, very high, but much less in compared to the 95% in those who are only treated with medicines. The incidence of kidney injury is much higher following a type A, and preoperative kidney injury is seen in 50% of the patients and 11% of these patients will require renal replacement therapy following surgery. When it comes to the issue of stroke and type A, stroke is seen in nearly 8% of patients presenting with a type A dissection. 
the incidence of stroke is much higher in those who have hypotension, shock, tamponade, and with the dissection of the arch vessels. In those without stroke, the hospital mortality is 22%. In those with the stroke, it is 40%. And it is 63% in those who are comatose. However, in a select group of patients where the brain injury is reversible, these patients have good outcomes and survival following surgery. Given our experience over the years, we have developed our own guidelines when it comes to acute type A. Some of our patients come in the most extreme form of the disease and, very, and come at a very advanced stage. We do not offer surgery in those who are in circulatory shock requiring stiff vasopressors and with obvious evidence of tissue malperfusion. In those patients who have a coma, who are, in com who are comatose or who have a stroke with evidence of irreversible brain damage, we do not offer surgery. Some patients come with radiological evidence of ischemic damage to the liver and intestine. And if the duration from presentation is more than 24 hours, we do not offer surgery because these patients very often will develop multi-organ failure after surgery and also sometimes cannot even come off the heart-lung machine. And in those patients where the family is against surgery or those with advanced age, frailty and comorbidities, we do not offer surgery. The surgical strategy depends purely on the location of the entry tear. The principle of surgery is simple. Excise the local tear, entry tear and also obliterate the false lumen. In those patients who have a patent false lumen, they can go on in the future to develop aneurysm in the other parts of the aorta. In those patients who have a tear involving the aortic root, the surgery involves a replacement of the aortic root. The valve may be repaired most often or replaced. The most common pathology is a tear in the ascending aorta. This can be fixed with, a, with an ascending aorta and hemi-arch replacement. Sometimes there could be a tear in the arch and these patients will require a total arch replacement. This diagram shows the location of the entry tear. The most common location of the entry tear it is in the ascending aorta. These patients require just replacement of the ascending aorta and hemi arch. We put these patients on bypass and cool the, temp cool the patient. And at 26 degrees, we stop the circulation. Then we open the aorta and fix the dissected flap. After fixing the dissected flap, we replace that portion of the aorta with the Dacron graft. Very often the valve will need to be resuspended in the Dacron graft. And then circulation is commenced through this, this sidearm branch. In some patients who have a tear in the arch, we'd have to open the arch and fix it and replace the arch vessels with this type of a arch graft. Nowadays, we perform the frozen elephant trunk on such patients where we stent the descending thoracic aorta and then separately anastomose the arch vessels. There is a wide variation in the early in-hospital mortality. This is for two reasons. One is the condition of the patient at presentation. Patients who are in a very cope who are in a very sick state do worse after surgery. And also more importantly, it depends on the surgical volumes of the center. Centers which have a high surgical volume have lower mortality when it comes to this operation. Patients who are hemodynamically stable and no malperfusion can have a mortality as less as 3% following surgery. Early risk factors following surgery include malperfusion, pre and post-operative stroke or coma, acute kidney injury, massive bleeding requiring transfusions, extensive dissection and redo surgery, cardiac tamponade or shock on presentation. Long-term factors include advanced age, female gender, and the co advanced comorbidities. Long-term results following surgery are encouraging. 
five year result is nearly 85%. At 10 years, it is 68%. And at 30 years, it is 38%. Freedom from aortic valve intervention or moderate AR is good with nearly 95% at five years. Five year re freedom from re intervention for the thoracic aorta is nearly 97%. However, in younger patients who have connective tissue disorders, they have a higher incidence of reintervention. The guidelines recommend uh, serial imaging of the aorta at 1, 6, and 12 months following surgery, followed by annually thereafter. Between 2012 and 2020, we saw a total of 144 patients with type A. We operated on 132 of them. The average age of presentation is 50 years. This is much younger when compared to the Western data where the average age of presentation is over 75. The it is seen more commonly in males. The time from onset of symptoms to presentation to our hospital is nearly 77 hours. This is in stark contrast to the Western data where the time of presentation is between six to eight hours. Preoperative stroke was seen in 16% of the patients, MI in 18% of the patients, preoperative kidney injury in 22%, ischemia in 2%, limb ischemia in 20%, and severe aortic insufficiency in nearly half. The reasons for this could be the delayed time of presentation. Mortality following surgery in our experience is nearly 22%. Aortic root replacement was done in 26 patients. Hemi arch, which is the most common type of surgery for this condition was done in 99 and seven patients required a total arch replacement. Emergency surgery for type A aortic dissection is still very high risk. Even though it has been, the first surgery was done in 1954, this operation still carries a very high risk and a learning curve. This operation does have a high incidence of complications following surgery as well. However, mortality with medical therapy is still higher, which is why surgery should be the first line of treatment. Specialist teams are necessary because these patients that have a lot of complications after surgery will require prolonged ventilation, tracheostomy, dialysis. Delayed presentation also leads to a higher mortality and complication rate. Standardized surgical strategies and management of these patients helps reduce the mortality and morbidity burden. I would like to finish my lecture with this anecdote. This is Michael DeBecky. Michael DeBecky is known as the father of aortic surgery. At the age of 97, one Sunday afternoon, he developed acute onset of chest pain. He had an inkling of what it might be, but like most patients, he chose to ignore it. The next morning, when the pain did not disappear, he went to his cardiologist who performed an echocardiogram and showed that he has a type A aortic dissection. At the time of presentation, his ascending aorta was five centimeters in size. Michael Debecki was very clear that he did not want to live out the last years of his life requiring surgery or any other form of life-saving intervention. He declined surgery. He went about his regular work. He went to work every day. And a week later, while giving a lecture to one of his, to his students in the hospital, he collapsed. He was immediately rushed to the intensive care where he was intubated. At this stage, he was in circulatory shock and death was, in, death was certain. At the time, his daughter and his professional colleagues took a decision to override his legal directive and operate on him. They took him into the OR. They replaced his ascending aorta. The surgery took a total of six hours. After surgery, he required a prolonged ventilation with a tracheostomy and even dialysis. He needed three months of hospitalization with rigorous physiotherapy, and finally he went home. After going home, his quality of life was good. He could come to work. He used to come regularly to work. 
he continued to give lectures and talk to other surgeons and at the age ripe age of 99 he died of natural causes i bring this anecdote for two reasons one is age alone is not a barrier for this operation michael debecky the father of aortic surgery he even devised the classification came up with the surgery he himself underwent the surgery successfully at in at 90 years of age and the other reason i bring it up is he in this in in his life he declined surgery he waited for one week he was lucky to be alive at the end of the one week because he did not develop a stroke or any other organ damage but at the end of one week when his heart failure had progressed significantly and he and death was almost certain surgery is the one that gave him two years of good quality of life and that's the lesson i would like to share with with you all today thank you i would like to uh, remind all the speakers i mean all the uh, delegates that there is a, a question that they can post their questions in the uh, question bar and at the end of the talks uh, the panelists will address the questions our next speaker is uh, dr sanjay op dr sanjay op is our consultant intensivist and head of the department of intensive care at narayana health bangalore he and his team have been very successful in managing patients with very uh, advanced comorbidities and complex conditions in fact it is his team and the expertise of his team that gives us the confidence of taking on these extremely complex cases uh please dr sanjay on to you include bleeding hemodynamic management ventilatory management temperature management coronary perfusion neurological issues renal function and metabolic profile along with pain management in the post operative period let's touch each of these individually coming to bleeding aortic surgery can occasionally incur significant blood loss close monitoring of the drain output is vital looking at the clotting screen carefully that is with looking at the platelet count the aptt ratio the activated clotting time the d dimer levels the inr the fibrinogen the hemoglobin and the hematocrit levels would be vital point of care testing such as teg and rotum comes in real handy the graph on the right is a typical teg wherein we are primarily looking at two aspects of the teg one is the r time and the second is the maximum amplitude or the ma the r time is related to the clotting time or the activated clotting time as you would like to call it now a prolonged r time would indicate that there is a need for either tranexamic acid cryoprecipitate or fresh frozen plasma whereas an ma which is low would indicate the the need for platelet transfusion because it directly relates to clot well, kinetics you skip everything man the audience won't know an advanced blood bank directive can prove useful because uh, the blood bank once notified that there's a major surgery happening could have a reserve stock kept for you just in case you need it pre operative strategies such as leap frogging are quite popular wherein if you have a patient who's got a good hematocrit then you could do autologous blood transfusion by taking blood off uh sorry for that mistake we'll be replaying uh, dr sanjay op's presentation right from the beginning Good evening everybody. Over the next 15 minutes I'll talk you through the initial post operative management of type A aortic dissections. The common problems we face when we do such cases include bleeding, 
hemodynamic management, ventilatory management, temperature management, coronary perfusion, neurological issues, renal function and metabolic profile, along with pain management in the post-operative period. Let's touch each of these individually. Coming to bleeding, aortic surgery can occasionally incur significant blood loss. Close monitoring of the drain output is vital. Looking at the clotting screen carefully, that is with looking at the platelet count, the APTT ratio, the activated clotting time, the D-dimer levels, the INR, the fibrinogen, the hemoglobin, and the hematocrit levels would be vital. Point of care testing, such as TEG and Rotum, comes in real handy. The graph on the right is a typical TEG, wherein we are primarily looking at two aspects of the TEG. One is the R time, and the second is the maximum amplitude or the MA. The R time is related to the clotting time or the activated clotting time, as you would like to call it. Now, a prolonged R time would indicate that there is a need for either tranexamic acid, cryoprecipitate, or fresh frozen plasma. Whereas an MA, which is low, would indicate the, the need for platelet transfusion because it directly relates to clot kinetics. An advanced blood bank directive can prove useful because uh, the blood bank, once notified that there's a major surgery happening, could have a reserve stock kept for you just in case you need it. Preoperative strategies such as leapfrogging are quite popular, wherein if you have a patient who's got a good hematocrit, then you could do autologous blood transfusion by taking blood off them for a few days before the surgery, and then you've got a nice new bag of blood ready for you in case things run out of control in the operating room or in the intensive care unit. Hemodynamic monitoring, invasive pressure monitoring like the screen on the right where you have your ECG, your pulse oximetry, your invasive blood pressure, your PA catheter reading, and you also need your CVP to be available. Role of a PA catheter, again, this is something which is debatable. However, depending on how your case goes, if you have the use of a lot of vasoactive agents, then a PA catheter role becomes mandatory because it is a gold specific therapy and it's a gold standard to direct hemodynamic management in a patient on a lot of vasoactive support. However, on the other hand, if you have a straightforward case, which is not requiring too much of inotropy, then maybe you could consider not having a PA catheter in place. An echo, a bedside transthoracic or a transesophageal echo both are quite vital because it tells you things like cardiac functionality, apart from the presence of collections and effusions. Ventilatory management. You need to watch out for hypoxia and hypercarbia in the post-operative period. Both of these are dangerous. Hypoxia can kill pretty quickly, whereas hypercarbia is a little more benign than hypoxia, but it can predispose to all sorts of arrhythmias. Present, uh, looking at a chest x-ray, looking for presence of pneumothoraces or pleural collection, like in the two pictures on the right. This is a large pleural collection here, but as here you can see two apical pneumothoraces in this patient can vastly help because your lung dynamics can get significantly affected by these two common features. Use of a bronchoscopy is vital. And when you are doing major surgery, having a bronchoscope handy is always helpful to clean out any kind of clot or debris in the tracheobronchial tree, which will aid with your ventilatory management. Extubation strategies have to be delineated and your team needs to be very, very aware of what is actually happened in the theater and what you are planning to do in the post-operative period. If everything has gone very, very well, then fast tracking these patients is not an issue at all. However, if there have been issues with large blood losses, you've been issues with compliance of the lung, then maybe delaying extubation for overnight would be helpful to you because you can recruit the lung well and then try and attempt a wean off the ventilator. Oxygen supplementation post extubation is vital. You can resort to things like facial or nasal CPAP therapy, or you could even use something like a high flow system. Both of these are quite helpful for managing your oxygen levels post-operatively. Extubation, AVG criteria, post-extubation targets 
need to be very clearly delineated to the team because you need to know, for example, if you're dealing with somebody who's a long standing COPD, targeting a high PO2 and a low CO2 may not be practical. So you could choose to accept a higher CO2 as long as the pH is more than 7.3, or you could even consider accepting a PO2 of greater than 75 if he's been a smoker for a very long period in time. So you need to tailor your ventilatory management as per your patient requirements rather than adopting the style of one size suits all. Temperature management is vital because it's directly related to your coagulation cascade. As you can see, the two triangles on the right where in hypothermia, coagulopathy and acidosis basically feed off each other as each one exacerbates the other, causing a further deterioration in the spiral. So you need to cut the spiral somewhere and then make sure that it doesn't deteriorate your patient's condition. There is a triad also, which is basically related to hypothermia causing decreased coagulation and when there is a coagulopathy, automatically there is a lot of blood loss, which can increase your lactate and acid levels in the blood, causing a lot of metabolic acidosis. And that in turn directly affects your cardiac function. And then your inotropy and your vasoactive drug requirements go up. So once the vicious cycle sets in, it becomes a little difficult to break. Patient warming devices grossly help in maintaining the temperature, something simple like a bear hugger, which is depicted here, or fluid warming devices here, which can warm your IV fluid as well as your blood transfusion. All these really help with regards to maintaining your temperature. Using a system like the one here, which is an Altheus system, is probably a little invasive because it involves a cannula uh, being placed into your inferior vena cava, and it gently brings up the temperature of your the core temperature of the patient to your desired level. It's a little invasive, so it has fallen out of popularity. However, many centers in the West still use this modality. Coronary perfusion is quite important to keep an eye out for, especially when you're doing type A type of surgery or bental procedures, wherein you re-implant the coronary buttons onto your synthetic graft. Looking for regional wall motion abnormalities, especially when your vasoactive drug requirements are going up and your PA catheter is showing a fall in your cardiac index. When you do your transesophageal echo, like in the picture on the right, this is basically a transgastric LV short axis view. As you can see, the septum and the RCA territory are all dyskinetic. So that tells you that maybe something is actually wrong with the coronary perfusion in this particular patient. So it gives you a, a, a dynamic indicator of what could possibly be the problem which is leading to a low cardiac output state in your patient. And coronary angiography at that stage would certainly throw a lot of light. Like for example, you could see here, there is definitely a kink in the right coronary artery, or you could have something like this where there is a obstruction in your LED. So all these can instigate poor coronary perfusion, which is a direct manifestation of low cardiac output in your patient. Coming to neurology. Neurology is something most of us are going to be quite worried about. Now, why, why is neurology such a big thing? Because unfortunately, your patient is quite sedated and asleep when he comes into the intensive care unit. Now, as long as your cerebral blood flow is in excess of about 22, 23 cc's per minute for every 100 grams of cranial tissue, you have a normal functioning brain. Whereas when it starts falling below that, you start seeing electrical dysfunction. And when it comes to about 12, 13 cc's per minute for every 100 grams of, of uh, neurological tissue, you start developing electrical silence, which very rapidly manifests as an infarction, which you want to avoid. So as you can see, you know, the drift is pretty quickly. So if you have monitoring, which basically helps you pick up this drift, then you can safely avoid the final infarction point, which is quite a big disaster, because at the end of working hard in the theater and then trying to work with them in an intensive care unit, this will thoroughly set back the progress of the patient. 
using a nurse monitoring is helpful in the immediate post-operative period. Many anesthetists would consider using this in theater itself, and that monitoring is transferred to the intensive care unit, where you've got electrodes on the forehead on both sides of your cerebral hemispheres, and you try and maintain a nurse score, which is reasonable on both sides. And that will tell you that your brain perfusion and your brain perf uh, functionality is running all right. SSCP monitoring is a little more dynamic with regards to your peripheral monitoring because it makes the premise that the spinal cord and in turn the brain functionality is normal if it is able to generate a somatosensory potential in the peripheries of the patient. A cardioembolic stroke is something which we would like to avoid. If you remember the first picture I showed you, you don't want to see this on an MRI scan because this would grossly affect the amount of hospital days the patient would need to stay in as well as the outcomes because the quality of life is not going to be good if you have a large cardioembolic stroke in the postoperative period. EEG monitoring is something which is recommended. However, again, it is labor intensive. What you need to look at is the abrupt slowing of your EEG waves. If the waves slow down, this is where you need to get a bit wary about. If your wave pattern is good, then you don't have to worry too much. But when you see this happening, you need to take some kind of evasive action to prevent progression of your neurological injury. However, bear in mind all these neurological parameters which you're monitoring, you need to have a system and a monitoring system which is quite foolproof because EEG monitoring, like for example, needs adequate amount of wax to be placed on this patient's head so that the signals which you get are quite good because all these little, little parameters which you need to take good note of make a huge difference into the final waveform which you see on your screen. Brain imaging is something you might have to do in the immediate post-operative period, especially if you start finding your pupils of your patient being dilated or anisocoric or non-reactive. And these would, would normally reveal something like this. You know, this is a dreaded thing in the post-operative period where you have a large infarct in this patient. Now, occasionally, if you have opted for things like going on to ECMO, for whatever reason, in the post-operative period, doing an MRI becomes out of question, whereas a CT can still throw a little bit of light on what intracranial problem you're actually facing. Neuromuscular junction monitoring is something you can resort to. Again, it is labor intensive. I've just taken an extract from one of the papers in New England Journal of Medicine, where they monitored aortic heart surgery for 223 patients. And then they avoided 12 patients who had stroke and they had about nine neuromonitoring alerts. So the inference from their study was the NMJ monitoring has got high sensitivity and specificity. It has a high negative predictive value, a low positive predictive value, and it leads to possible intraoperative or early postoperative interventions, which could change the dynamics of postoperative care. Renal function and metabolic profile is something you need to keep an eye out because after a bypass run, because of the SERS response, you initially have polyuria. And if you start seeing oliguria or hematuria, like in the picture on the right, which could happen after a long bypass time, then there is a possibility your renal dysfunction may set in immediately in the next few hours or in the next morning. Potassium alterations are something you need to bear in mind because low potassium levels and high potassium levels are all arithmogenic. The potassium is directly related to your sodium. So when the sodium moves out, the potassium moves into the cardiac cell and it is facilitated by the sodium potassium ATPase. So if due to some reason, if your sodium levels are being altered, your potassium levels will directly bear the brunt of it and it may result in arrhythmias. And one of the common things which causes an alteration in this is directly your renal function. Presence of metabolic acidosis and monitoring lactate levels is quite imperative because if you get an ABG like this with a low pH and a grossly deficient base excess, that tells you that there is organ hyperperfusion and the vital organs are not getting what blood supply they need to get to monitor their functionality. And hence, metabolic acidosis, once it sets in, it again starts the vicious cycle 
of a low cardiac output state, which will worsen the lactates, and then you will have a problem on your hands. Blood glucose management is something you, you need to consider quite seriously because excessive blood glucose again causes cellular dehydration. And once there is cellular dehydration, it worsens the metabolic acidosis. So keeping blood sugar under control is a good thing. You shouldn't try to achieve too tight a control because hypoglycemia can occur and that's a little more worrisome as well. However, maintaining a blood sugar level of 120 to 180 milligrams per deciliter in the immediate post-operative period is a reasonable thing to do. Coming to the pain relief, pain measurement is something which you need to do and give good pain relief for your patients. Normally, sternotomies are not very painful. However, pain itself is a trigger for worsening metabolic acidosis and secondly, causing respiratory acidosis because patients who've got pain, they don't tend to breathe very well. And if they don't tend to breathe very well, they tend to silt up their bases, which will deter you in early extubation or extubation on the next day. And secondly, they may have a higher need for ancillary ventilatory therapies such as CPAP or using high flow cannula for a longer period in time. And it will inadvertently increase your ICU stay. So good pain relief is something you should actively consider. Use of opiates and NSAIDs to achieve this particular endpoint is good. There are patient control analgesia pumps like shown in the two pictures there, which can be easily programmed and the patient controls the button which is there. And once he or she presses the button, uh, X amount of calculated intravenous pain relief is delivered to the patient. This pump also has a cutoff value. So the patient, irrespective of how many times they press it, the pump will only deliver the maximum value which you have keyed in. So the chances of overdrugging or overdosage or sedation does not exist when you use the PCA pumps. Role of an epidural catheter for a stonotomy could be considered as overkill, but there's enough evidence in literature to say that a high thoracic or a low cervical epidural catheter placed between C7 and T1 can provide for adequate post-operative analgesia when you use an epidural catheter at this level. Role of a paravertebral catheter is something you could consider as well, but uh, remember an epidural catheter carries a problem with a hemorrhagic tap. So it's always ideal to do all of these uh, catheter placements on the eve of surgery rather than doing it on the morning of surgery. Because if you have a little bit of a hemorrhagic tap, then there is always a worry when you give heparin to go on to bypass. And that can be completely avoided if you do it on the eve of surgery. And then this will also help you in managing your post-operative pain quite nicely. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sanjay, for that very detailed uh, lecture. Another reason why uh, we want the audience to understand that the, uh, the importance of a pan-systemic monitoring and uh, uh, monitoring and taking care of these patients is crucial for good outcomes in aortic surgery. Our next speaker is Dr. Nimrat Grewal. Dr. Nimrat is a cardiac surgeon at the Leiden University Medical Center with a specialized interest in aortic surgery. She has also done her doctorate during her training in the field of bicuspid aortic valve. She has written many research. Uh, she has done a lot of scient basic scientific research in the field of aortic disease and also has a lot of uh, peer-reviewed articles. She is going to talk more about the, aortic, the research in the area of aortic pathology. On to you, Nimrat. First of all, thank you everyone for joining our first Aorta Alert event today. As we have discussed earlier this afternoon, the aim of our Aorta Alert program is twofold. Firstly, we want to create awareness on the clinical presentation, diagnosis and treatment of a type A dissection. And we've had some wonderful presentations today highlighting these subjects. But we also aim at better risk stratifying patients prone for this condition and finding other treatment options. 
and therefore understanding the underlying pathophysiology of thoracic aortic aneurysms and dissections is of utmost importance. My presentation focuses on the scientific aspects of thoracic aortic aneurysms and dissections. For those who have just joined our meeting, my name is Nimrit Grewal. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon at the Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. Today, I would like to discuss with you the normal development of the aortic valve and the ascending aorta, and how an abnormality in the development of the aortic valve can lead to a structurally different ascending aortic wall. And I'll do this by highlighting a condition which is the most common cardiac congenital anomaly, the bicuspid aortic valve. In this condition, patients have two cusps in the aortic valve position instead of three cusps. And this patient population have an, has an increased risk for developing a thoracic aortic aneurysm or dissection. And after this, I will discuss a recent study in orthopathy of type A dissection patients, which has many parallels with the earlier discussed bicuspid aortic valve population. Firstly, the normal vascular wall highlighted in this hematoxylin eosin staining. The sending aortic wall is divided in three layers. The innermost layer, the intimal layer, has endothelial sites lining the luminal side of the vascular wall. The medial layer is divided in three layers, the inner media, the middle media, and the outer media. The middle media, actually the whole media, is characterized by the presence of vascular smooth muscle cells, which are shown in this alpha smooth muscle cell actin staining on the right. Further, the, midi, the media comprises of extracellular matrix and elastic lamellae, which are shown in this resource in fuchsin staining. The adventitial layer has several components, such as nerve cells, fat cells, epicardial cells, but also some vascular smooth muscle cells lining little blood vessels, which supply the vessel wall of nutrients. It is important to understand how the normal vessel wall is and how a normal vessel wall develops in order to find differences with normal cardiovascular aging and pathology of a vascular wall. Therefore, we recently did a study on the normal development of the vascular wall in patients with a bicuspid aortic valve and patients with a normal tricuspid aortic valve. And in this study, we investigated the ascending aortic wall in several age groups, ranging from a pregestational premature age before birth till the adult age and all age groups in between. In this presentation, I will highlight the development of the intimal layer as that is of most relevance for the type A dissection population. These pictures which we are seeing now are, uh, they are from a patient with a normal tricuspid aortic valve without any known syndrome. And what you can see in these figures is that the intimal layer before birth, this is a gestational age uh, ascending aortic wall, 18 and a half weeks, the intimal layer consists of one single elastic lamellae. Whereas after birth, this intimal layer grows in thickness. We all know the process of atherosclerosis, which is a pathologic thickening of the intimal layer, which has many implications as it leads to several pathologic conditions. But the intimal thickening, which I'm now talking about, the first few years of life, the intima, physiologically grows in thickness. And this has many important functions for the rest of the ascending aortic wall. As the intimal layer, for instance, is important for the EMT, the epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So it's responsible for the structural vascular smooth muscle cells in the media. And this is to illustrate the difference between the intimal layer in a pregestational ascending aortic wall, which is the picture above, and an adult ascending aortic wall, which is the picture below, and you can see the difference in thickness of the aortic wall. While the development of the ascending aortic wall is closely related to the development of other components of the heart. During embryogenesis, the heart and the vessels are the first organ to form. In the first few weeks, the cardiac tube is formed and the heart looping takes place. 
In the weeks thereafter, there are many processes which take place simultaneously, such as the septation of the atria and the ventricles, the conduction system is formed, the coronary vasculature is formed, but most importantly, the valvulogenesis is also formed in this period and also the development of the ascending aorta. There are a few cardiac progenitor cells, namely the second heart field cells and the neural crest cells, which are important for these processes. And several genes make sure that these cardiac progenitor cells can differentiate, maturate, and propagate to several processes so that all these processes can actually take place simultaneously. But you can imagine if there is a defect in one of these progenitor cells, which should be, uh, supplying cells to different processes together, then a defect can lead to a defective uh, process altogether. And this we have seen in patients with a bicuspid aortic valve. Several genes are responsible for second heart field cells and the neural crest cells working. But if there is a mutation in one of these genes, this leads to a defective signaling of the second heart field cells and the neural crest cells. So a normal tricuspid aortic valve with three cusps is not formed, but, but a defective valve is formed with two or even one cusp, a so-called bicuspid or a unicuspid valve, as you can see here with the Seifers classification type 1, 2 and 3. But as these cells were not only responsible for the development of the valves, but also for a normal um, vascular wall, this can lead to a structurally abnormal ascending aortic wall. We tested this hypothesis in a recent study, which is um, published in the journal Thoracic Cardiovascular Surgery, and we investigated the expression of vascular smooth muscle cells in the media of patients with a normal tricuspidortic valve and patients with a bicuspidortic valve, which is shown on the right. And you can see that the expression of the differentiated vascular smooth muscle cells was significantly lower in the bicuspid patient population as compared to the tricuspid patient population. But the developmental defects do not only have implications for the vascular smooth muscle cells in the medial layer, but also for the development of the internal layer. If you go back to that study in which we uh, investigated the development of the vascular wall, I'll show you a few figures of uh, the internal layer in the bicuspid patient population. In a pre-gestational age, the bicuspid patient already has a significantly thicker intimal layer as compared to the normal controlled tricuspid patient. And this is true for, for the whole life. So the premature intimal thickness is significantly greater as compared to any other patient population age group in this group, as you can see in this figure. And this is highlighted in uh, this figure again the pregestational intimal layer is significantly thicker as compared to the adult intimal layer, which is completely um, the opposite as compared to the tricuspid control patient group. And this highlights that several processes in the ascending article can be distorted as the normal intimal layer is not formed, which should have been uh, taking care of several processes, such as the vascular fluid muscle cell differentiation in the ascending aortic wall. Now, keeping these uh, results in mind, we will now talk about the orthopathy in patients with a type A dissection. We obtained ascending aortic specimen during type A dissection surgery to investigate the ascending aortic wall and compare those to samples which were obtained from autopsies which served as controls. We did several stainings and compared the demographic characteristic of the patient groups with each other and did not find any significant difference between the type A dissection group and our control group. We wanted to have a standardized histomorphological characterization of the type A dissection group and compare these with the control patients, but also with patients with a bicuspid aortic valve, which have an increased risk of developing a type A dissection. We also paid extra attention to the location of the dissection plane. We all know that the dissection, the definition of the dissection is a tear in the intimal layer, but we observed as surgeons that the tear, which actually takes place, is mostly located at the outer media, so the outermost layer of the medial layer. 
And after describing the location, we sought to provide an explanation of the location, whether it's degenerative or it could be embryologically determined. But how do you describe a pathologic vascular wall? Every research group, every study group, and every pathology group has its own way to describe the vascular wall. And we tried to uniform this pathologic description in a way that everyone could do it in the same order. Our research group um, contributed to the so-called consensus statement on surgical pathology of the aorta, which was um, published in the cardiovascular pathology. And this pathology uh, score comprised of a few um, and this pathology score has several components to describe the vascular wall, such as the intimal architecture, which is the endothelial and the subendothelial layer structure, the absolute intimal thickness, intimal atherosclerosis, and this picture is a MOFAT stained um, tricuspid aortic valve patient of someone who is around 60, 60 years old and it shows a fibrous gap in the intimal layer. Medial vascular smooth muscle cell differentiation, medial elastic fiber degradation. As we have seen earlier, the resource in Fuxin beautifully shows the elastic lamellae, and if there is degeneration, you can see this in this staining. Mucoid extracellular matrix accumulation. In the beginning of my presentation, I told you that every vascular wall has extracellular matrix. But once this, the structural components in that vascular wall are lost, such as vascular smooth muscle cell nuclei, this gap is filled with extracellular matrix, which is called mucoid extracellular matrix accumulation. And this weakens the vascular wall. Medial cystic, cystic medial degeneration, also called cytolytic necrosis, is the loss of smooth muscle cell nuclei in the media, which also weakens the vascular wall and adventitial inflammation. So all these different pathology score features, fragmentation loss, thinning of elastic fibers, disorganization, mucoid extracellular matrix accumulation, smooth muscle cell nuclei loss, and medial degeneration were scored in both the type A dissection group and the control group. But we'll first start with uh, defining the location of the dissection plane. As I told you, we observed that the location of the type A dissection was mostly found at the outer media level. But to objectify this, we calculated a ratio of the dissection plane as compared to the total vessel ratio. And we compare this to the level of the fascia vasorum. The fascia vasorum is a network of small blood vessels which supply the, blood the, the total vessel of nutrients. And this network of blood vessels is mostly found at the outer media level. A defect in these vascular smooth muscle network, uh, sorry, the fascia vasorum network, has been described earlier in several pathologies of the vascular wall, such as aneurysm formation. And in this study, we also looked into the ratio of the fascia vasorum network as compared to the total vessel ratio, and found that the location of the dissection plane was comparable to the location of the fascia vasorum, which indicates that in also in the type A dissection pathology, the fascia vasorum might play an important role in the pathology. Looking at all other pathology markers, pathology score markers, we found that in the dissection group, the expression of all the pathology markers was significantly greater as compared to the control group. So the middle media was the most diseased part of the aortic wall. And this figure again highlights beautifully that the location of the type A dissection is at the outer media level, so at the level of the fast vasorum plexus, as I just showed. Besides the profound pathology in the middle media and the location of the dissection plane, there was a very interesting finding in this study, being that the intimal layer was significantly thinner in the type A dissection group as compared to the control group. And importantly, all patients in this type A dissection group had a tricuspid aortic valve. If you just go back to um, the developmental figures which I showed you, 
the type A dissection group had an intimal layer comparable to the bicuspidotic valve group in which the intimal layer was also significantly thinner as compared to the control group. So in conclusion, in our type A dissection group, the dissection plane consistently appears in the outer media at the location of the vasoplasorum plexus. The middle media is the most diseased part of the vessel and the intimal layer is significantly thinner. And this uh, led to our triple hit model the type A dissection starts with an intimal tear, which is easier in patients who have an embryologically defined smaller intimal layer, after which the tear propagates through the diseased middle media and ends up reaching the vascular plexus, where the tear is, is leading to, a, 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 to tearing the middle and the outer media apart at the level of the vascular plexus. Like we have found in the bicuspid valve population, we are now looking into an embryologic explanation for the type A dissections as well, as the intimal thickness is comparable to this patient population. That's why we are now working at many clinical and histopathological studies uh, together with the Leiden University Medical Center and the Norina Health to better understand the pathophysiology of both thoracic aortic aneurysm formation and dissections. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nimrat, for that very interesting talk. And uh, I hope it lays, gives the audience an understanding uh, into the work that is being done into, un into the pathophysiology of aortic dissection and what can be achieved in future research. Now we will move on to the uh, diagnostic algorithm that we wanted to show to our attendees uh, in, in cases of acute chest pain. Imrat, you can share your screen. Yes. My screen visible right now? Yeah, it is correct. Okay, great. Well, while we come to our final session of this meeting, uh, firstly, um, Dr. Varun and I would like to thank all our speakers for their brilliant talks today. Your contribution has made this event so valuable and we've learned really very much from you. Uh, to increase awareness on type A dissections and reduce mortality, we need all medical professionals to know what kind of diagnostic flow there is. The condition is, like I've been said earlier this afternoon, it's often misdiagnosed as an acute coronary syndrome, and therefore we urge all medical professionals to use the diagnostic flow chart, which is based on the ESC guidelines and is actually a summary of all presentations which were given today by all experts. This is the diagnostic algorithm I would like to discuss in detail with you. Dr. Satish Govind and Dr. Srinath Kumar already highlighted uh, this algorithm. Therefore, um, we'll go through it um, in a little less detail. On basis of the medical history, the clinical examination and ECG as STEMI might be diagnosed. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, a TTE is recommended as an initial imaging investigation. Class of recommendation one, level of evidence C. If there is a suspicion of an acute aortic syndrome, a TOE or CT scan is recommended according to the local availability and expertise, both class of recommendation one, level of evidence C. A negative TOE or CT scan rules out the diagnosis. The diagnostic workup to confirm or rule out a type A dissection is highly dependent on the a priori risk of this condition. The diagnostic tests can have different outputs according to the pretest probability. In hemodynamically stable patients, the probability of an acute aortic syndrome should be evaluated, which is a class of recommendation one, level of evidence B from the guidelines. A risk assessment tool based on three groups of information has been proposed since 2010. 
The first group is predisposing conditions such as Marfan syndrome, the family history of aortic diseases, known aortic valve conditions, um, or thoracic aortic aneurysms as a previous uh, history. Group two is pain features, chest, back, or abdominal pain, described as an abrupt onset, severe intensity, or ripping or tearing. And group three is the clinical examination, evidence of a perfusion deficit, systolic blood pressure deficit, or uh, neurologic deficits. A scoring system is after that proposed that considers the number of these groups involved ranging from zero to three. The presence of zero, one, two, or three groups of information is associated with increasing pretest probability, which should be taken into account in the diagnostic approach. In the high probability patients, a TTE is performed. In case a type A dissection is diagnosed by either the presence of a flap, aortic regurgitation, or pericardial fusion, the patient is referred to a surgical team or center. If the TTE does not show any signs of a type A dissection or the echo is inconclusive, then a CT scan is recommended, class one, level C. If that concludes the diagnosis, the patient is referred, else an alternative diagnosis is considered. In case of an initially negative imaging with persistent suspicion of an acute aortic syndrome, repetitive imaging is recommended, class one, level C. In the low probability patients with a score of zero to one based on those three groups, which I just mentioned, the D dimer levels can be checked. In case of suspicion of an acute aortic syndrome, the interpretation of the biomarker should always be considered along with, with the pretest clinical probability, which is a class 2A level C. Because in a case of low clinical probability, a negative D dimer level should be considered as ruling out the diagnosis, class 2A level B. But in the case of an intermediate clinical probability of an acute aortic syndrome with positive D-dimer, further imaging tests should be considered, class 2A, level B. In patients with a high probability, testing of D-dimers are not recommended. If the TOE or test X-ray raises suspicion of a type A dissection, additional imaging is recommended, which can confirm the diagnosis or rule it out. Even though the algorithm seems easy and is a very good guideline, the diagnosis remains very difficult. And Dr. Shetty would like to add some thoughts on this. Dr. Varun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nimrat, for that, uh, for summarizing uh, the entire algorithm. And uh, well, what, what we want the audience, uh, the take home message for the audience is that, yes, uh, type A aortic dissection is often missed, and uh, the uh, once the diagnosis is made, it's often delayed. And uh, when a patient walks in with acute chest pain, or um, you know, uh, type A di dissection should be on the uh, on should be high up on the differential. Now, uh, the price one pays is very small. You know, even if you are pro probably even if the probability is low, you can do very simple tests like uh, the bedside transthoracic echo. You can do a simple blood test and a chest X-ray. All of this uh, will effectively rule out a type A aortic dissection, and uh, you know, um, uh, and it will not. Uh, you know, the patient does not have to incur any other invasive or expensive tests after this. Now, having said that, uh, this uh, this uh, webinar is directed towards the first line responders. By, by first line responders in chest pain, I mean the bedside, uh, the cardiologists in the uh, CCUs, the ER physicians, and the radiologists, because these are the these are the physician group that encounter these patients on the first as soon as they enter the hospital. And uh, our understanding is that sometimes uh, they may not have uh, many of these physicians may have a suspicion of a type A aortic dissection, and which is why we want to use this opportunity, this webinar as a platform to launch our online second opinion clinic. Basically, we would be uh, launching an online platform, which will give physicians uh, from other centers uh, easy access to our physicians. They can easily upload uh, the echo images or the CT scan images and even have a chat uh, and even a con you know, a messaging platform uh, to uh, consult with our physicians. And uh, this will help them rule out an acute aortic dissection in the first place. And it is a learning opportunity for them to 
you know better understand this disease yeah so uh with this i hope all the uh, uh delegates enjoyed the presentations that were given and i hope they had a, they have a much uh, more deeper understanding of uh, type a aortic dissection i uh, uh and uh, and also uh, we would we are very keen to in conducting platforms like this in the future educating and reeducating physicians about the possibility of type a aortic dissection because this is such a pathology that if you get the diagnosis right and if you refer the patients on time the survival is is very good dr nimrat would you like to add anything well, i think it was a beautiful note to end this um, first aors alert webinar it's really been a great pleasure having you all on board a special thank to all our expert speakers who took the time to educate all of us and of course the audience you have been great Thank you to Avyaya as well for your technical support during the event. Um, like has been said, our program aims at reconstructing the healthcare by sharing knowledge, educational material, collaborative data collection, educational webinars, and national guidance. So that a structured assessment would allow rapid confirmation of diagnosis and subsequently reduce the likelihood of mismanagement. Today's event was a great start of the International Aortic Disease Week. I hope to see you again in our next webinar. Have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. You -bye. to stop the live streaming.